I'm Daniel Raven Ellison, and I'm a guerrilla geographer. Exploration is very much the physical manifestation of geography. It's doing geography. It's about seeing the world in new ways, but also thinking about how people can see you in new ways as well. My invitation to you is to rethink how you engage with geography. To maybe think about becoming a guerrilla geographer too. Thank you all very much for coming. It's wonderful all to see you here. Um, I'm going to present an idea to you. It's an idea that's a work in progress, really, this idea of guerrilla geography. Um, some of it is appropriate for adults, some of it's appropriate for children, some of it's appropriate for no one, arguably. Um, um, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. Um, for me, geography is really important. That's what geography is to me, really important. It's really important to all of us here and everyone around the world. Yet, despite its importance, despite the fact that it's so important for world trade, for making sense of climate change in terms of all sorts of global conflicts and problems, despite the fact it's so useful for us when we're trying to decide where to live, where to die, where to find someone to love, despite the fact it's used for all those things, it's largely misunderstood, damaged, and undervalued by um, many people within our political classes and in school systems and elsewhere. And it's almost like there's a conspiracy that exists that people don't want us to understand the world as, as well as we could do. Um, but I also say that actually for me, geography is anything that happens somewhere. Um, everything that we know of happens somewhere, but those somewheres aren't just sort of physical places that you can visit with your, with your body. They're also imaginary places like Hogwarts, like Middle Earth, for many people in this room, Hogwarts will be more of a real place than New Zealand. Yeah, you know more about that place than New Zealand, so maybe Hogwarts is more real to you than New Zealand is. And everywhere that is real is only imagined anyway, and all of us have a different imagination of what a place is like. So for me, this idea of imaginary geographies is very important. I'd like you to sort of hold that with you. But if geography is everything, then the the question you have to really ask is, what's it useful for? What's the point of being a geographer? What's the point in having a subject, which is geography? And um, Professor David Lambert, a teacher educator in the UK, talks about how geography is a lens for seeing the world, for making sense of things, for spotting patterns, for making sense of things like uh, this week's Geography Awareness Week theme, interdependence. You know, the idea of everyone and everything being interdependent upon each other in one way or another is a big, complex idea. And to unravel that, we need to learn about it. This is a map by an award-winning cartographer and geographer, Ben Henning. And what he does is he makes cartograms. So what he does is he takes different continents or countries or land areas, and he inflates them according to a different variable. In this particular case, it's looking at risk of storms. And you can see the United States as that massive swelling thing up there. And it's interesting because you know, when you're trying to make a decision like, shall we cut FEMA? as a decision, when you're trying to make a decision about how you're going to deal with um, tsunami warnings, maps like these help to inform your decision making about where to make those investments. And it's not just maps like these that are useful. It's also maps like this one, the Anthropocene, the layer of the planet that is where we live, humans, our influence. In this map, the, the continents and countries are inflated to show the number of people who are living there and the veins that run through them are the different transport systems that allow us to get our food supplies to one another and for me to be here and to be sharing ideas with you. And for me, these show why geography is not only so important, but so beautiful as well. But geography isn't just serious. I'm 32, I think, yeah, I'm 32, <laughs> and um, I've just started to try skateboarding. And I didn't realize until I started going on my son's skateboard how awful roads and paths are in my country. So on the, on the far left here is like near pristine, perfect skate country in terms of longboarding, going so increasingly terrible down towards the far right, which is just impenetrable. And actually the one that's second from right is actually sort of like gravel that's full of glass where a sort of car had been smashed in. And actually the reflection for me was not only how town planners had sort of completely neglected the fact that anyone who's cycling or skateboarding might want the landscape for other things. 
But for all the people who are disabled and need disabled access also have to struggle because of these small scale level geographies. And these places where things are, whether you're in advertising or transport or food, whatever your profession is, where is really important. And that's also true of Mushroom, our cat. Just listen to this. Isn't she beautiful? She loves that cushion on that chair. For her, that geography is so important. If you're sat in that chair, she will claw you <laughs> until she has that chair. To occupy that space, to have that territory is really, really important. Um, just zooming in a bit further now, we've sort of started off at a global scale and we're sort of zooming in through these scales. These are my chubby hands. And what I'd like you to do just for a moment is think of a scar or a tattoo or a place that's visible on your body that you know that people could see and look at that has a memory attached to it. Because the way I see it, our bodies are like living maps, right? So on this, uh, where's the pointer? On this here, you see this here? So that's a scar from falling off a skateboard. <laughs> see that one there? That's a scar from, scar from carrying a TV set into a classroom and then jarring myself on a whiteboard. And it sort of just, you know, and I picked at it, which white did that thing. And <laughs> that down there is where when I was two, I was folding up a deck chair and I cut my finger off and that's put in ice cream and then they sort of sewed it back on again. And it, luckily it's not a proper joint, so that's fine. And then we all know what this is here. And I've got a tattoo somewhere as well, but I'll leave that to your imagination. <laughs> all of us, our bodies are maps. And we can think of our bodies as landscapes that can be explored, that are sensitive. Just in the same way that landscapes, physical landscapes, are constantly changing, our bodies are too. And there's a prejudice within geography to constantly think about these big scales, continents, borders, boundaries, continental drift. But actually, for young minds, and maybe for many people in this audience, that's not quite so interesting as where you like to be touched. Zooming in even further, here's a photograph I took on with my iPhone with a little microscope I bought from £8 from Amazon. I'm so pleased with it. <laughs> and that's dirt on, on me. And we now sort of photograph my son's nails sometimes just to make him aware of how really manky he's being. I've got a nine-year-old. But I'm just trying to make the point with this that you can see these these, these valleys, these hills, these slopes. You can see a landscape within my skin. So geography is about scale. We zoomed in from really big and important to really tiny and really important, um, which brings me on nicely to sort of the next part of this, which is about exploration. And for me, exploration is very much the physical manifestation of geography. It's doing geography. And all of us here are explorers. Being an explorer is inevitable. In our children's books, we talk about the fact that we're all space explorers. We're time travelers. We're spaceships. All of us are those things, and those things can't be taken away from us. And you know, the, the history of large institutions like this is to maybe focus a fair amount on what this cartogram shows. So this shows global accessibility, the places that are largest, the places which are hardest to get to on the planet. Places like Greenland and the Sahara Desert the Himalayas. And for me, those places are fascinating and beautiful, and they should be explored and discovered. But I'm also interested in the familiar. This here is a map of Bristol, which is a city in the west of England. And I started doing these walks, these urban earth walks, as a project to represent cities. So in many ways, when people think about cities, they tend to think of the skyscrapers or the slums. But the lived experience of most people in cities is, is somewhere else. In 2008, for the first time in human history, more people started living in, in urban than rural places. Yet the idea of being an urban explorer, the idea of walking across an entire city, seems in some ways more strange or abstract than going for a walk in the mountains. So you know, if, if my friends went for a walk in the mountains for a few days or walk in the countryside, it'd be hardly worth a pub conversation. But if I walk across Bis Bristol in a few hours, that's somehow interesting, despite the fact it's our habitat. There's something slightly weird about that. So I wanted to do some walks which forced me to explore cities in a way that would represent them away from the guidebooks, away from the media agencies, and get me to see a city in a new way. So what I did was map the cities out with, um, with uh, a colleague called Kay from the London School of Economics. 
This particular map shows deprivation within the city and quintiles of deprivation. And the idea is to walk across the city, in this case, looking at the factor of a multiple deprivation, staying within the different colours to represent what that city would be like. So in this case, Bristol, but this particular film here is a walk I did across um, Mexico City. Taking a photograph every eight steps, over 75 miles, three days of walking, um, as to give a different vision, a different view um, of the city. And what's fascinating when you, when you take photographs like this is not only do you create a resource and a way for people to explore and see the city, in this particular case, over a few minutes rather than over a very long period of time. Um, when you're actually physically doing the walk, you, you mourn. You mourn the things you don't capture through your photography. Normally, when you walk through a city, you take photographs of people or objects. You're constantly scanning around, looking for things. Using this method, you're always forced to photograph forward. And for me, what I found what was most fascinating about doing this project isn't what you see in the lens, but it's my sense of loss for the things that I didn't photograph and my questioning of why it is that I mourned not photographing those things. What is it about my upbringing that meant that those things were more interesting than what was darkly in front? The other thing that I found interesting about making these, this, this sort of type of film is the way that space becomes the focus. Where you're walking into becomes the focus of, of vision. Whereas things that normally, again, were photographed are marginalised into the pictures. And in Mumbai, literally people living on the streets would appear in the corners of the pictures. And when I tell people about walking across Mexico City, a fair few people go, oh, dangerous. And you say about walking across a city, people get sort of quite worried for you. But the reality is that what we hear most in stories and anecdotes is the bad stuff. People aren't really programmed to tell good news in the same way as they are to program to say bad news. So we hear bad news a lot, both from the media and from people. If you walk across Mexico City, most people are really friendly and really interested in what you're doing. And I've walked across a lot of cities, and I've only had a couple of problems. And one of the time was being shouted at by a northern man in Manchester who was just drunk, and that wasn't really a problem. And the other time was on this walk. But the really interesting story about that is that um, there was a, a large group of, of sort of female activists who were sort of helping to hold the community together. And they saw us coming where I was walking in a, in a small group. And they warned us and they told us where to go. So actually the story wasn't, here's a dodgy place. The story was that we were helped by people to, to get across the city. So then the next kind of walk we started doing, away from urban earth walks, was called an urban story walk. And this is where you take a particular theme or a particular issue and just focus on that. So if you imagine a landscape, a, a, a physical landscape with ridges and mountains and valleys. With this project, we were saying, right, well, what if we looked at those ridges and mountains and valleys, not from a landform physical point of view, but from a social, cultural point of view? In this particular case, city farmers helped us with some mapping around violence. And this is sort of South London, and it's reported violence. So actually, there's parts of town which probably experience far more violence than what's on this map, with in particular sort of ethnic populations. But we're walking through this place down here, it's called Kingston. You wouldn't think, if anyone knows Kingston, you wouldn't think it was particularly violent, but they had high reported violence. We came across this pub, and you could smell this pub, like within the centre of this area, from literally 20 metres away, you could smell the beer. I've never smelt a pub from 20, 20 metres away. And then we turned the corner, the, the symbol for the pub was a razor blade, um, which was amazing for that particular place. This, this map, which I think is beautiful, which almost looks bruised, shows depression in North London. And again, in this particular one, we wanted to climb to the peaks, these sort of peaks of the highest levels of, de of depression. So we kind of walked across the city, staying in this sort of very bruised area. And it, it was, as we expected, very, very depressing in that particular case. So my, my last slide on exploration is this one. You know, all those things I just showed you are explorations which anyone in this room can go and do tonight, tomorrow, any day. Um, you might want to choose your theme, you want, might want to choose the city you walk across, but it's something that anyone here can do. This is a great example of that. This is a video of OpenStreetMap in action, and it's 750,000 people making millions of edits of mapping with GPS systems on their own feet. And what's amazing about this is it's showing a collaborative, open, social revolution in exploration and geography where people themselves, through a Creative Commons process, are taking exploration on and 
literally mapping the world and in many places going to places where other agencies have never been to in disaster situations where no one's done mapping before and it's desperately needed. And for me, this really sums up a moment in exploration that's taking place right now, one where the power has been taken away from a few and been handed over to the many, to us. So guerrilla geography. I mean, all that, to some extent, feeds into this idea of guerrilla geography. Um, so guerrilla geography, for me, this idea, and I'm very open to having a conversation with you about this, is creative, alternative, radical, strange, exceptional, alternative geographies that might be that you're looking at a different kind of geography or it might be something you're doing within geography that's very different in some way. I've always been quite fascinated by ecological footprints, the amount of land that's needed to support a community of people. And so I wanted to do something with uh, the pupils in my school and we got together several hundred bedsheets and covered fields and bedsheets to show the amount of biologically productive land and resources that was needed to support the lifestyle of one average student in our school. And it worked out at about seven global hectares. So for anyone who's not up with what an ecological footprint is, a good way to imagine it is this. If you were on an island on your own, how much land would you need to give you all the stuff you have? But the thing is, it's a bit more complex than that because the land may include things like seal pups and chocolate and a bit of coal tan and all these things, which are obviously fragmented all over the world. Does anyone here eat seal pup? It's possible. Anyway, so all these things come together. So the actual land mass itself is, um, is fictional. Um, but despite that, um, so what we did was sort of create this giant footprint. An American footprint, so you know, would take up the, the extra field further on as well. You guys would need that for the, your average, would need that space there as well. Um, someone in Bangladesh would just need that sort of little area there. Um, and the point is that there isn't enough resources to go around. And actually, the world goes into ecological debt um, a few months into the year because we're over-consuming the amount of biologically productive resources that are available to us. And then this happened. There's a group of us had a campaign called Give Geography Its Place. And essentially, we were really angry because no one called geography geography. There's lots of really amazing media that's made that's geography but not called geography. And we're very cross. And we're very cross that geography was marginalized in the curriculum. It's marginalized in schools. In many parts of the world, geography isn't even properly taught in schools. And so we, we're trying to think of some ways to sort of raise awareness to this issue. And we sort of came across the idea of guerrilla geography. And this was the very first thing we did a few years ago. This policeman moves in a moment. He's a bit grumpy. Um, and actually, the, the, <laughs> these security cameras are dud security cameras. There's nothing in them. And we had a very clear rule as well when we were using them that we would only have the security cameras in positions where we could zoom in or out or pan where there were actual security cameras around us. And all we were doing was drawing people's awareness to a geography that existed within the landscape, raising that awareness through that particular guerrilla intervention. In this case, you might recognize the building in the background. It was blown up in the recent Bond movie. We were drawing awareness to extraordinary rendition and um, waterboarding by holding an international waterboarding championships in different key places around London at a time when the Bush administration was saying that waterboarding was completely fine. Um, so we were, our point geographically was, well, you know, what you're doing is completely fine, but in a private space. So as geographers, we're going to take it out of that private place and put it into a public place and see how people think about it. For me, it's about teachers and learners who are engaged in irregular, curious, critical, and creative activities and thinking. And that might be the content they're doing, or it might be how they're exploring or how they're engaging with things. I'm not suggesting people are necessarily too naughty, but thinking about being creative, about seeing the world in new ways, but also thinking about how people can see you in new ways as well. Thinking about how you, you go about your lessons and school times so that different things are unusual, regular, formal, unexpected or abnormal. And that can be done with the teacher, the learner, the environment, or all those things. So one of my big projects I work with on the Geography Collective is called Mission Explore. And it's taking a lot of these big ideas around guerrilla geography and bringing them into a way that can be understood by, by children. And we work on this a lot with the education team here. And if you go to the Geography Awareness Week website, you'll see lots of uh, Mission Explore resources that you can use for free and download for free. And uh, we've developed them into a series of children's books, website that is sort of gamified, so children can win points and badges for going out on explorations and doing guerrilla geography. And we do this at things like music festivals. We just started working with a travel company called Discover the World to bring guerrilla geography to trips to Iceland. 
We go on tour and visit schools and places. This is the back of our van, so when you open up at the back, it looks a bit like a, a crazy explorer's office. There's us doing some of our activities from our books. And the sort of missions are things like this. So I really love this particular mission, which is to try and find a lost cat. Because there's a discrete geography to where cats go, how fast they travel, what routes they take, what might have happened to them. Have they been catnapped? Are they high on catnip? Have they been stolen by someone? Have they been run over by a car? And the reality is that cats are found. And it's a great piece of citizen science and citizen geography to go and find and return a pet. But other missions in our books include things like this to dress a bunch of old people in hoodies and see how people react to them. <laughs> Who can find the most beautiful poo? To measure from one place to another by rolling around. To try and cross a forest without touching the ground, which is very hard to do in a, in a conifer forest, but quite easy on a deciduous, maybe. Is it really unlucky to walk under ladders? That can be scientifically tested. Work out the ratio for the amount of trash in a river compared to the number of mammals or other wildlife. That was one of the missions we worked on with National Geographic here. Really, my invitation to you is to sort of rethink what geography is as a result maybe of, of seeing some of this. To rethink how you engage with geography, to maybe think about becoming a gorilla geographer too. Um, anyone can become a gorilla geographer. Everyone's an explorer. And just say that geography is beautiful. It is important and it's really awesome. And you know, there's some people in society who, who think that, that the word geography is problematic, that geography doesn't have value. And we all need to work together to help people to understand, no, actually, geography is of central importance. And we need to plan our, our curriculum, our ideas, how we think about our lived spaces, our transport systems, through this amazing idea. Because if you were to pay an organization to come up with the idea of geography, it would be a very, very, very expensive thing to do. Um, that's me. Thank you very much.